There's a poem written years after the event by Longfellow. It goes like this. It's the 18th of April in 75, and there's now hardly a man alive that remembers that famous day and year. It was the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Oh. <laughs> 18th of April. 80 years ago today, Jimmy Doolittle led a bomber crew off an aircraft carrier with 16 Army bombers, B-25s, and shocked Japan by flying 800 miles from the Japanese coast. That's the closest they could get. They bombed Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, and the Japs were totally shocked. Where did these planes come from? They didn't realize that they, could, they were launched Army planes off of an air, the Hornet, the aircraft carrier. Uh, three of those planes were shot down. They didn't have enough gas to come back to the carrier, so they ditched in different parts of China, some ditched in the water. Uh, eight of them were captured, uh, tortured to death. One man was starved to death, beaten to death. There was a movie about them called The Purple Heart that was made. And it so lifted the spirits of the United States after the bruising we took at Pearl Harbor. It was a great, great morale uh, builder. So. We salute Paul Revere, and we salute Jimmy Doolittle <coughs> for their actions back then. Um, we're going to introduce some uh, first-time attenders, but first of all, we've got some really special guests here tonight. Um, we don't have many Korean War veterans that speak anymore, but uh, we have an Army colonel. His name is Monty Piercefield. He spoke here about 12 years ago. He served the Army for 34 years. Monty, could you raise your hand real high? Uh, listen, listen carefully. Uh, he was an Army soldier fighting in the Korean War in November and December of 1950 at the Chosen Reservoir. How many of you heard about that? OK, very short. We had pushed the North Koreans all the way up to the Chinese border. There were 15,000 Marines and 3,000 soldiers. Then the Chinese entered the war with 100,000 guys, a surprise. And those people had to retreat below zero weather. Monty was there, and he was on the staff of a Lieutenant Colonel, Don Faith, who won the Congressional Medal of Honor. And I just want to thank you, Monty, for enduring that. Uh, you can talk to him afterwards. And Glenn Dorman, you are at the table there. Raise your hand, Glenn. That's Major Glenn Dorman. He, he, he spoke at our first dinner, first year in Fort Washington. He was at the first cab, and he fought and was nominated with the Congressional Medal of Honor. It hasn't come through yet for him. But at that table, we have two of our Korean War veterans. And gentlemen, sometime if you want to, maybe we can come back up here again and we can have a question and answer for you two. So I just want to warmly welcome you again, and you did a lot of fighting in terrible conditions. So we salute you and thank you. <laughs> to my right, Alan Buchholz, come on up and tell us what you have briefly. Thanks, Ken, and I always appreciate the time that you give me. Uh, on behalf of the Ozaki County Historical Society, and everyone in this room is a historian, I just want to uh, remind you of some of the events we have coming up. And on your table, there's a, a sheet with, with some of those. On May 14th, we have a concert over at the Cedarburg Performing Arts Center, uh, the Radio Rosies, and it's a tribute to the music of World War II. So that old time 40s and 50s music, um, for 20 bucks, come on over. And we have our, our World War II event is back after the COVID uh, gap, and that is May 21st at Pioneer Village, and that's from uh, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. that day. We have a light day the day before, it's a school day, but if you can't make it on that Saturday, come out on Friday. Uh, not as many reenactors and uh, events going on, but for a smaller fee, you can get in that day. What I really want to pitch tonight is the volunteer opportunity at the Ozaki County Historical Society. We have events all through the, uh, the good weather season, whenever that comes. <laughs> Starting with our World War II event in May, 
going on through Flag Day, a car show, uh, the bluegrass event in August, and, and so forth. If you go to our website, and there's a sheet on your table, if there's not enough sheets to go around, just take out your smartphone, shoot a picture of this, and uh, think about volunteering for us. There's a Sign Up Genius on our website that you can sign up for whatever job you like to do. But think about World War II, for example. You sign up for a couple hours to uh, help with uh, food or admissions or something. You get free admission, you get a meal, and you get to see the whole event for free. So um, there's a lot of uh, opportunity to do that. If you have the, and I know there's a lot of retirees in here, uh, if you're looking for something to do, my phone number and my email is on the bottom of that page. Uh, carpenters, painters, landscapers, anything that you would like to do out of the village that hasn't got anything to do with our events, I'd love to hear from you. So uh, go ahead, there's some, some flyers on those two events, uh, the Radio Rosies, as well as the World War II event. Just click a picture of that with your cell phone or take the flyer along. Thanks again, Ken. You're welcome. Look towards me here. We always post our next meeting. How many of you were here last month to hear Pete Olson? Well, Pete uh, had a question and answer period where he handed out the questions you could ask. And he's coming back for part three because he hadn't finished everything. He couldn't be here tonight because uh, I think he had a granddaughter born in Illinois where he had to be down there. But Pete is coming up May 16th. That's the third Monday. And we take our summer break and we start over in September. So if you missed it last month, come back in May, because I think you'll really be uh, impressed uh, with his presentations. Uh, I'll tell you the format that we're going to have here in a little bit, almost ready to start saying hi to first-timers. But I want to mention with regards to the price increase. We thank the restaurant. They've not raised the prices on us for 20 years. That's phenomenal. And um, the food is worth it, but we just are appreciative and hope you have understanding. Yeah, of course. And we have expenses beyond the food also. We have mass mailing of postage. We have 600 people on our email list. And that requires us every month to pay fees to the email services. Um, we rent the hall. We pay the bartenders a little bit. So thanks for your understanding. And I keep a little money aside to put people up overnight from out of town to pay for their motels and the gas expenses. We've done that about three or four times in past times. And my technical assistant, he comes here to set things up, but he has a conflict. His name is Paul Radke. You know him. He's on the Cedarburg government, and he has a conflict now Mondays where he has to go over there. He might be back later. But he does all our technical work, the setups for the emails and all that kind of thing. And we pay him for his... Uh, work and technical advice. So thanks for understanding. Hopefully someday the inflation will go back the other way. We'll see where that goes. Now, in a moment, I'm going to introduce our first timers, but I want to tell everybody something. These men are going to introduce themselves, and they, to begin with, will point on the map where they fought and what they did uh, for a couple, two, three, four minutes, and then we'll open it up for you to question them one by one specifically, or just a generic question, and all three of them can respond. They realize they've got to get right to the point because there's many men here and they won't carry on too long. But so already mentally start getting your questions together, and I'll take the microphone out for you. But I want to say something here. Um, every Legion post does a lot of things, and these men here, you know, there's an old story, 90% of the work gets done by 5 or 10% of the people. These gentlemen do a lot of work. They're here almost every day. There's so much that goes on, and up and beyond. So not only do they serve our country, they continue to serve our community and our veterans uh, day by day. And uh, we thank them. We're honoring them today. So why don't we just give them an applause and welcome right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They have family members here, and they're going to moment but now I'm gonna call your name you're a first-time attender we want you to be welcome here we'll send you a US mail or an email uh, from henceforth uh, describing what's going on we got look, looks like a Ron uh, that Schleider from Cedarburg <laughs> he 
He's going to tell you about his service, but first of all, Dick Lallensack, we will point to you later when you give him the mic, but he has family here. Who are they? Point him out. Over here, my girlfriend, Debbie Lenz. My son, Randy. Raise your hand high. I right, pull your name. And his two kids, my grand twins, Michael and Teresa. Right. And Teresa goes by the name Reese. Where, where are they from? They're from Fredonia. Gosh. Thank you. Now, Ralph, you have some friends here, too. And all these men will introduce themselves, but who do you have in your family? I got my wife, Jean, sitting right there, along with my daughter, Tracy. Yay. And my grandkids, um, Kaylee and Colton. Try not to hurt yourself. <laughs> not a fan yet. Okay, once again, our format. These men will each go to the podium, give a quick introduction who they are, That's where us. they fought. They'll show you Aren't on you the map. Take, give a hell of a chance? Yeah. Oh. You didn't bring any family, though, did you? No. So that's why he doesn't have a chance. <laughs> he's all alone in this world, and he's, spoke, he's spoken twice here before where his family had, had attended. So uh, his wife still loves him, so don't worry. She's, she wasn't here tonight. Al has us. Yeah. yeah. Al has us. Yeah. Brothers in arms. So without further ado, why don't you take the podium, tell us who you are, and give us a quick intro, intro and show us on the map. Yeah. All right. Uh, my name is Al Richards, and uh, I married an Italian, and as John Giuliani in the back can testify. And when he put this up, I thought this looked like Italy, and I was going to say, my family is from up here. <laughs> but uh, you did a wonderful job. <laughs> No, uh, the Mekong Delta, I spent uh, all my time down in uh, for a while just south of uh, Saigon. And then after about six months, uh, we were with the, what they referred to as the Riverine Force. It was a joint uh, effort with the Navy. And uh, I was telling Kevin back there, who was a Marine, that originally when they uh, put this together with the Navy, they thought that they'd uh, use the Marines, who are, are more used to amphibious stuff, uh, because the Mekon is just all water. I mean, it's you're either in the swamps, rice paddies, or you're getting rained on, you're always wet. Uh, but uh, they had so many Marines up north, uh, where Ralph was, uh, that they decided to uh, use the 9th Division. I was with the 4th and the 47th and the 9th Division. Um, that was January, I think we got there January uh, 27th, 1967. There was a, a book written about the group, the company that was I was with, uh, Charlie Company. Uh, it's called Charlie Company, the boys of 67. Uh, it's a very interesting book about Vietnam and our group because uh, out of the uh, 200 some people in the company, in Charlie Company, about 160 of us were drafted. And we were together from day one, from the time we got drafted until uh, the time we went home. So uh, we got to be very close uh, unit. A lot of these uh, other people got sent over one by one. We all went all all together as a group. So uh, again, we were uh, really a close uh, unit. Um, I think about 27 were out of the 200 were killed in action. And by the time uh, our year was up to come home, I think there was only 30 of the original 200 left in the company that hadn't been wounded and sent home or, or something to that effect. So saw a lot of action. Uh, before you sit down, thanks. Uh, I want to point on that map. From the top of Vietnam to the very bottom is roughly 1,000 miles. California, from the bottom to the top, is about 800. So 
So this gives you an idea geographically. There's a lot of territory there. Before you sit down, Alan, tell you were wounded twice, and people can ask further. Briefly, the, the circumstances of your two Purple Hearts for everybody. Uh, you'd think I'd learn to duck after the first time. <laughs> but, uh, no, um, like I said, we were in the uh, Mekong Delta the whole time. And um, although the Delta area is only about a quarter of the area of Vietnam, over half of the population lived down there. And that's because it was such a fertile area. Uh, the rice and the rubber trees and all that stuff. Uh, so when we first got there, like I said, we were a little bit south of uh, Saigon. And uh, there was an area called the Runsack area, which was uh, mostly swamps and uh, islands and stuff. And we had one island that we referred to as the Booby Trap Island. Uh, and it was one of the few times that when we went out on a mission that uh, we used to call them flak vests back then, that I actually had a flak vest on. I was a forward observer who would, uh, if we ran into trouble, I would call in. Uh, it started out calling in the mortars, but I basically called in everything after that. So I carried a radio, and uh, uh, the first time, uh, my good friend tripped uh, a booby trap, a hand grenade type booby trap uh, that went off and it, it uh, got him all through the back of his legs as he walked away. Um, the lieutenant that I traveled with, uh, it split one of his fingers like a banana. Just, and for me, the only thing, I was kneeled down on a dike, so the only thing that really was exposed was my neck. So that's, I, I caught it in the neck. And uh, I remember when the medic came over, I, I asked him, uh, is my ear still there? I was, it, it was so loud uh, and my ear hurt so bad that I, I had a picture in my mind that my ear had gotten blown off. But, uh, you know, especially when you reach up there and you come down and your hands are full of blood. But, uh, uh, I healed up in country uh, with that for about two or three weeks uh, before I got sent back with my unit. And after a couple more weeks, then I started going back out in, in missions. And about six months later, uh, we were crossing a rice paddy into a uh, V-shaped uh, tree line. And, uh, it was an uh, ambush set up by the Viet Cong. And uh, when we got, we were the second, there was uh, my buddy's group again. He was, he was out in front of me uh, with his squad and then I was the second one back. And uh, I just told the guys, spread out. You know, the old uh, saying in the military, spread out because one round would get you all. I just got done yelling at them uh, to do that. And uh, they opened up. And of course, your first thing is to hit hit the ground, or in this case, it was a rice paddy. You know, go down into the the water, and I could see the rounds hitting, bouncing off, skipping off the water all around me. And then it felt like somebody came up and just kicked me as hard as they could in the shoulder. And uh, I flipped over. I had a quick release for my radio and everything on me. And I remember thinking, oh, I finally get to use this. You know. You know. <laughs> And uh, then I crawled uh, back. We had just lunch. So it was noonish, a little later. Um, and uh, so I crawled back uh, to the dike. And uh, the medic came over and, and checked me out. And uh, a friend of mine, another uh, buddy of mine, came over. And I kept telling him, Gan, get your head down. Get your head down. And all of a sudden I heard him yell, and he got shot right through the shoulder, just missed his heart, and uh, went down into his rib cage. So there was two of us sitting there uh, that the medic had to keep coming back over to us to make sure that we didn't fall asleep because your face would fall in the water and you'd drown. Uh, but we laid there 
And that battle went on. Uh, it was dark by the time we got out, by the time we uh, were able to ca crawl back and, and get out to the helicopters. So. Thanks. We'll ask more questions of you. Uh, next speaker, take the <coughs> microphone. But I want to mention, I left somebody out as the first time to tender because he didn't get the, the card to me. Bill Curtis, will you stand up? You, he's a friend of mine, and he fought in uh, Gulf War, and he was over in the Middle East. So, Bill, we didn't mean to leave you out, last but least. So, glad you are finally here. Another Army veteran. Okay, well, I'm Ian as Ralph Beck, and um, I was in the Marine Corps. I joined in 1965, and when I got to Vietnam, I was basically in the Northern I Corps. Um, I started out at a small helicopter base called Kiha, which was just um, north of Chu Lai, which was a jet base. And um, if this is Da Nang, I guess it will be Da Nang tonight, right? Okay. I was about down in this area here, and um, I was there from June of 66 until well, November of 67. We moved up to Fubai, and then the um, Marine Corps or the military had a a program at that time, you extended six months in country again, you get 30 days free leave um, anywhere in the world. So I was home for Christmas in 67, got to see the Ice Bowl, and then I went back over in um, January 67, and um, and that was January 68 then, back to Fubai, but when we moved up, everything changed. We had a lot of different personnel. It wasn't like the prior 16 months when I was down to Kiha. And um, Lieutenant Ellis came into our billet one day and said he needed a volunteer for Kason. So I go, yeah, okay. I never heard of the place. I had no idea what it was like, but I learned quickly. And uh, so I spent um, February, March, and April in uh, Kason during the Tet Offensive of 68. And that was an experience. And then um, I went back to our home base of Crane Tree. And then in June, I swore I'd never go back to another outpost, and in June we opened up a, another um, LZ stud, it was called, and then later on Van Grift, um, a fire base, and that was on Highway 9 between um, Dong Ha and Quezon, and um, I volunteered for that, and that was, I mean, we got hit a couple times, but Quezon, every day it was, um, are we gonna, it wasn't a question of are we going to get hit today, it's just a matter of what time to come in and how bad is it going to be, so. Well, well, Ralph, point on the map where the DMZ is. Back there, people may not be able to see. Point the yep. DMZ and show them where Quezon was. Right about there. We were about nine miles or so just south of the DMZ. DMZ is the militarized zone. That was the communist North Vietnam yeah. below and the south. Uh, quick word. Tell them about the siege. How many Marines were there, and how long were you surrounded by the enemy that was trying to just destroy you? How the siege, I think it was, the base was a quarter mile wide, three quarter miles long. We had a 3,700 foot Morris batting uh, runway, and when aircraft came in there, they never stopped. Um, if you got like the C-130s, I like to think those guys had a probably nice job. But when they come in there, that plane never stopped. They come in, I come down the runway, go into the landing, um, drop off area to kick the stuff out the back ramp, to turn around and route it out. And um, the C-123s was only had two engines, they put jet pods on those to get them a better lift to get out because the idea was to climb out as fast as they could because they had one that was coming in one day and um, a Vietnam pilot in a spotter plane <coughs> was coming in on the opposite side, the opposite runway. So he waved the C-123 off, and when he went around, he got shot down and lost everybody in the plane that day. So I mean, it was um, it was a hot zone from the day you got there. I mean, it was just, you were safer staying on the base than trying to get off. We'll ask you more questions as far as uh, uh, that specific. So. More questions for him afterwards. So let's get our third speaker up for a quick intro, and then we can open this up and you can have more specific questions to each man or general uh, questions. Speaker number three. Hi, I'm Dick Balancek, and uh, I served in the Army in, uh, I, uh, I'll tell a little bit of a story way back. In 1966, the draft was closing in on me. I went for my physical, and thought, this is it, I'm gone. A week and a half later, I got a letter from the draft board. 
I was deferred and reclassified to two-way apprentice. And I go, what? So I would worked at Milwaukee Gear and I'd been trying to get a four-year apprenticeship. So I went to work early that day. I was working second shift. I go, oh, didn't anybody tell you? You start your apprenticeship next week. <laughs> I got it made. That war is going to be long over before I'm done. I got my journeyman's card on July 23rd, 1969. I was in the Army, April 17th. Landed in Vietnam, the 17th of May, 1970. And I was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division. We were around in this area here, and back in here was a place called the Aishaw Valley. And the time that I was out in the boondocks, most of that time was spent around the Aishaw Valley. And it was pretty hairy once in a while. And uh, uh, like I was going to say, when I shipped over there, I shipped out of California. I got on the scale. I had been on leave for five weeks, drank a lot of beer. I weighed 197 pounds, dressed in jungle boots, fatigues, and so on. And in July, after I came by, I, was, I got flown out to Fire Support Base Catherine, and we worked that area uh, around the Aishaw Valley. Uh, I remember I walked within about two kilometers of the Appai Mountain. Did anybody ever hear of the Appai Mountain? It was well known as Hamburger Hill. The worst battle, one of the worst battles the 101st was in, and I walked about two kilometers from that thing uh, in uh, the summer, early summer of 1970. And uh, that was a bummer, whatever. So, uh, oh, when I shipped out of California, I weighed 100, I got on a scale, and I shipped, weighed 197 pounds, dressed in jungle boots, fatigues, and everything. And after I got off of Firebase, uh, I'm sorry, when we went in for stand down, which was vacation, near the end of July, I, and I got in for the stand down, I got on a scale, dressed exactly the same way, I weighed 159 pounds. <laughs> I lost 38 pounds in a short time. So, it was hectic, and I thank God thousands of times that I got out of there alive. And eventually, we were located off of Firebase Birmingham, and we're moving, and my RTO was behind me. And he says, Sarge, got a call. Negative, we're dancing. A little while later, he comes again. Sarge, it's urgent, you gotta take it. Well, after about three times, I thought, I better take the call so we don't just stop. I got two guys over there, two guys over there, me and Yarto over here. I take the call, proceed to a Lima Zulu ASAP. Proceed to a landing zone as soon as possible so Rasta number 29 can be picked up. Oh my God, this is a Red Cross call. If a family member died back in the States, the Red Cross would get you home in 48 hours. We had just gotten new roster numbers. And I say to my Arturo, who's roster 29? He's digging through his paper. Sarge, it's you. Oh my God. Here I am in a god dang war. And I figured it was a Red Cross call. Something happened to somebody in my family back home. Well, it took me about an hour and a half to get my team hooked up with somebody else. I finally get to a landing zone and a chaplain would always come and talk to you with this case. Like, remember, landing on Firebase Birmingham, and here comes Chaplain Young. Oh, I just wait. Hey, sir, I hope you can hang around here for a while. He walks on by. What the heck is going on here? So I go to the TAC, the Tactical Operations Center. And here's Sarge now, come in here. So we go into the battalion commander's office, which was a bunker about eight feet by eight feet. There was about seven of us in there. We're opening up the American area of operation to the Vietnamese woodcutters. And the woodcutters hauled off mahogany and teak. And that low area of Vietnam was loaded with mahogany and teak. And they have to go through a checkpoint. And we would like you to run that checkpoint. Wait, what is this? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Does that mean I don't have to sleep out in a goddamn mountainous jungle anymore? You've been living in a bunker up here in a fire base. And that's when I started working with the Vietnamese people. And I did that job until uh, December 31st, where I moved up to brigade and I worked in civilian affairs and civic action. Again, working with the Vietnamese people an awful lot. Well, have a seat. You have more things to show, but let's let's open up for question and answer. Each of you have more to, more to tell. So I'm going to come out here with the microphone. Make your questions short to the point. They will answer short to the point. We've got a whole hour to cover this. So uh, 
Now the fun starts. Raise your hand. Who has questions? Okay, we're done. <laughs> okay, I've got one. Dick, stand up. You don't have to go to the podium. Uh, you told us many times you experienced raids from B-52s that were close by. Uh, tell them what that's like and how far away you were. Okay, this started out, we were going up a mountain called the Cockabo, and it's terrible. There's a trail there that's about a foot and a half wide, all the grass is packed down. How many NVA do you think may have gone up and down that trail to make that path? You know, three, four, five hundred? I don't know. No matter what I said to my platoon sergeant and my uh, platoon leader, we're going up, we're going up. Finally, Brother Harvey came forward. Man, y'all gotta listen to Sarge. Listen to what he says. We keep going up this trail, we're gonna all be dead in a couple hours. So they said, okay, we'll pull back. And I remember we pulled back about 100, 150 meters, and an 82 millimeter mortar opened up. And how did I know it was that? I heard them so often, I knew what they were. And it's probably 900 to 1,000 meters away from us. And I know that ain't coming to us. That's going to the fire base. And I died for the radio. Their call sign is offset six, minus five, five, nine, or echo. You said their call sign twice, then yours. Say, like, offset six, offset six, minus five, nine, or echo. Prepare for incoming, prepare for incoming. I say again, prepare for incoming. We have an 82 mic mic popping. And whoever was on duty recognized my voice and the intensity blew the siren right then on the fire base. I don't remember how many, it was like 27 or 28 rounds were fired at the fire base. And we got a call about 30, 40 minutes later. Everybody was undercover before the first rounds hit because I called and let them know that. That was fantastic. And I got a bronze star a couple months later, and that was mentioned when I got a bronze star. Is, is this the B-52 bombing? No, That's no. what I asked you about. Tell them about that. Okay. So they pulled us back, and we were going to go up the next day again, but they pulled us back and took us about 10 kilometers north. And I wonder why they did that. So that night, I'm on guard, and I heard a cyclic sound, kind of like a I'd never heard it before, and I'm cupping my ears, trying to figure out where it's coming from, and I couldn't tell where it was coming. Now, in the corner of my eye, I see an orange ball. I look over there at the Cockabo Mountain, and it erupts into orange balls, <clears throat> and about 10 seconds or five seconds later, the sound and the concussion hit us. It was a B-52 strike. We were literally bouncing inches on the ground. And it was unbelievable. They used to say, I was the only one awake when, it, when I heard it. And all, everybody was awake, but there was only six of us in the team. We were all awake. And what the hell was that? Everybody's asking. I said, and then we heard the afterburners of the B-52s as they were going away. That was wicked. Thank you. Raise your hand. Okay, stand up. Come on up here. They won't hear you. They won't hear you. Mekong Delta uh, experience. I, I get a rash if I get too much sweat. I'm thinking you guys are in this water all the time. What was that like? How did how did that? That's got to be for you, Al. How could you counter that? I mean, or did you just? get used to it or what? I don't get it. I mean, parasites and everything, you must have been surrounded by that stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, we saw all kinds of interesting things out there. Uh, I, I saw something one night, I don't even know what it was. But uh, we would go out, uh, we were a little bit uh, different than because uh, if we were on base or if we were on uh, during the monsoon season, down in the Delta, everything was so wet that we actually stayed in, on a troop ship in the middle of the Mekong River. And uh, we would take, uh, we'd load up early in the morning when it was still dark yet, uh, uh, you know, the ones with the front that drops down. And uh, we'd load up on there and then we'd go out uh, to wherever our mission was 
and uh, they would drop us off and we'd go out for uh, two days, three at the most, uh, because uh, like I said, you're, you're always wet. You're either walking through water or you're, you're getting rained on uh, or something. And uh, so then when we'd come back to the boats, uh, if we were like when we were in this rung set area, uh, it was a real thick mud like knee deep uh, black uh, mud and when we'd come back uh, the boats would pick us up usually helicopters would pick us up from where we were take us to an area where the boats could get at us again and then the boats would take us back to the base or the ship and uh, before we could get on they had uh, couple of Navy guys standing there with big hoses and we'd all get hosed off uh, <laughs> but the you know it was like take a shower you know here uh, but uh, then once they did that uh, what we would do is uh, of course we'd go in and uh, take a shower or get cleaned up or whatever put clean clothes on and then we had to walk around with our uh, pants legs rolled up to our knees and uh, shower shoes, you know, uh, tongs, uh, uh, so that our feet would dry out. Uh, so otherwise, they were having uh, so much trouble with the uh, jungle rot with the feet and everything. So that's how they, they kind of combated it. It would be two or three days out, and then you'd come back for a day or two, uh, walk around, get dried out, and then go back out again. More hands, raise the hands. We got one over here, and we'll get one here. We'll get to everybody. Were any of you involved with the gate climbing the tunnels and caves and so forth under the ground? Uh, I didn't go into the caves. Uh, they uh, had guys to do that, usually smaller. Uh, guys to do that, uh, but we did find them in the area we were in, uh, which amazed me the, the tunnel system they had because, uh, again, everything uh, was uh, water-based. Like Dick said, when a, a B-52 would come over and uh, he could be dropping a bomb uh, way off from where you were, and the land would actually, you'd, you'd see it like a, a wave, a ripple. And it was because uh, it, was, it was such a water base down there. But they still had tunnels uh, that we found. Uh, and again, we, we would go out as a, a company si a size unit and uh, kind of on a search and destroy type thing. We would go out looking for the enemy. And uh, usually when we found them was when they started shooting at us. But uh, uh, kind of like guinea pigs, I guess. But uh, we would all, uh, after the battle, go through and then find these tunnels, and then uh, we would usually just blow them up. We'd, uh, we didn't send anybody down into them. Uh, but uh, part of the problem with fighting Viet Cong, where we were, was uh, their elusiveness that you could be in a full-fledged battle all day long, and uh, night would come, and the next morning, they were just gone. You know, they, <laughs> I don't know if they used tunnels or whatever, but uh, that was one of the major problems fighting them. When you did engage, uh, all of a sudden they would just disappear. Next question. Um, I have a couple of two-part one is, what was the uh, standard issue item that you found most valuable, and what was the um, unauthorized item that you found most helpful? <laughs> and, and then the second part of it is, uh, how did you actually rest, and was there anything that you particularly liked to do for relaxation when you could relax? Each, each man can answer that. One, two, three. Okay, uh, I would say the the most important thing that I I had uh, was what we called P thirty eight, 
Do you know what that is? The can opener, yeah, for our sea rations. So that that was probably the most important thing. Um, in a lot of areas, um, our group, uh, like when we came back on base camp, they would actually take our weapons away from us. Uh, that, you know, we didn't, and uh, when you go into basic training, you train with a uh, bayonet and everything. We didn't have any of that. Uh, so a lot of the guys, myself included, uh, rode home and had them sent uh, the, your hunting knife. You know, guys from Wisconsin, everybody had a hunting knife. So um, that was what I carried. I think my, probably one of my um, most useful items was on my slack jacket. I carry out was M1 bayonet, and that was for C ration. It was good for snapping wires off of C ration in cases like that, um, because otherwise um, we had no other means of, of doing it. So as far as um, things that meant the least to me, at one time we got the, they set the paymaster up from Quang Tree up to Quezon to pay us. <laughs> Why? I got $212 in military scrip. You couldn't do a darn thing with it. You sent this guy up risking your life, his life, to pay me with the money that meant nothing right then. So. That point that was that was useless. <laughs> it, it's all different things. Uh, Al talked about something that his parents sent him. My parents sent me this knife. I carried this knife in Vietnam, and uh, it was used many times. And uh, I had a camera that I carried. I bought this camera down at Fort Polk, Louisiana, Patriot 7S, and I carried this camera with me all the time in Vietnam. And you know, there's uh, the, the type of war that I was in compared to what Ralph, I mean, what Al was in, I was in a mountainous jungle area. There wasn't any uh, sand dunes or whatever around. There, it was all up and down mountains, which was wicked, climbing up and down them, and that's what we did. And uh, somehow we made it. We'll get to your question. But wait, wait, wait. Doug Rollins is a friend of ours. He's been attending for 20 years, and he has a gift for Al Richards. Al, uh, this is going to be a special memory for you. Doug, tell him what you have in your hand and uh, who makes it and all the history on it. I work for JW Speaker, or I did. I'm mostly retired now in Germantown. They hold the patent on the P-38 that they did back in the 50s. Raise, raise it high for they can see it. Everybody knows what they are. Yeah. We gave out a bunch of them one time here I on the table. Uh, they still they still stamp them out, but they're mostly for campers now. The military quit using them. But uh, they developed this for the Army Corps of Engineers, or the Quartermaster <coughs> Corps, in the year, probably early in the war, and then the way the military works, they they should license other companies to make it, and a lot of them you'll see say Shelby on them, and that was one of the other companies. But when the war ended, the patent was issued to JW Speaker because they originally developed it. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm gonna bring you. I'll bring you a bunch, Al. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Doug. So if you have a handful of those next time, bring them and we'll pass them out to everybody. Thank you very much. One second, we'll get to you, Mark. We have Ken. How did, how did the civilian population accept you? Uh, uh, that's kind of a, a, a tricky uh, thing. There would be uh, times uh, we called them off times, but we were still going out, but we would take uh, doctors and medical equipment out to villages that didn't have it, and uh, there we were well received. But there would be some areas uh, that we would go through, and if we got into a firefight or something, and the next day we went through and we found uh, piles of rice or, or food, we destroy it so that the enemy didn't have a source of food, but the local villagers didn't care for that either. Ralph, anything? Go ahead. Um, I was mostly at fire bases, so I never really had any contact with the civilian population. Um, 
in fact, where I was, there really wasn't any civilian populations around their places, so. Yeah, yeah and actually where I was was uh, mile-wise, I was probably by 25 or 30 miles south of where he was. And up in the mountainous areas, there was minimal civilians around, if ever any. And one time, we were a swing battalion, and we were down in the area around the villages, and the people were just fantastic. They treated us great. Well, it was very nice. A good experience. Next, uh, who has one, one second. Who has the microphone? Just wondering if anybody knows why they called it a P-38. Yes, it takes 38 times to go around a can. I hear, I hear. Um, when you got your um, big best meal, ham and um, lima beans, <laughs> you stick that in. It takes 38 times to go around a can to open up the lid of the can. So that's where P-38 comes from. <laughs> Right, right. So, here we have a young man. Why don't you stand up so they can see you? Stand up on top of that chair. Be careful. Uh -oh. So they can hear you. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh, what was the standard issue weapon you guys usually carried? I had for myself was an M14 rifle, yeah. Um, that was part of the air wing, so we had M14s. Uh, I trained with an M14 the whole time. We were at Fort Riley. And a week before we went over, we were issued the M16s, uh, which after carrying around an M14 was like a Maddie Mattel gun, you know. Um, and uh, we used that, and it was early on with their usage, so there was a lot of jamming problems and uh, uh, things like that until they got some of that straightened out. Just like in uh, Saudi Arabia when they took some of the weapons over there. They didn't uh, count on all the sand and everything getting into them. Uh, it was the same with us. I carried an M16 when I got to Vietnam. The serial number of it was 846775. And uh, the M16, as Al said, was a very precise weapon and it had to be kept clean. And I inspected the guys on my recon team inspected their weapons often, and they learned after the first couple inspections to keep them clean. And my M16 never failed me or misfired one time. And I don't know how many rounds I shot through it. I have a question for uh, Ralph. Ralph, it was well known here about the case sign, and uh, everybody knew what happened to the French. 1954, at the Ben Phu, they were surrounded by the North Vietnamese. And the French thought they'd hold out, but the North Vietnamese received Army 105 howitzers from the North Koreans that they'd captured from us and the South Koreans. And they brought these howitzers in and laid siege to Dan Ben Phu, where the French collapsed and had to surrender. And the concern here stateside is, uh-oh, they got the Marines surrounded now at Quezon. Are they going to wipe them all off, and they're going to have to surrender? So from you on the ground, how did you men see it? Did you look like, uh-oh, we are in big trouble, we're done? Uh, what was your whole idea there at the time? Did you, did you at any time have real fear that, like, this is the end? Well, we probably we knew we were surrounded, and there was no way to get us out. Um, Highway 9 was closed, and um, there was no way to get aircraft in there. So we were, had about 6,000 Marines on the base, uh, along with Arvins, um, one, one sector of it. And it, it was surrounded by 30 to 40,000 NBA, but we had very good air support um, with the um, Phantoms and the a A1s, um, as far as A4s, as far as um, air support on the perimeter. But we could actually sit. We had, um, I got a picture at home. Of trench lines where they were digging in towards our base and one day uh, we're, we lived in un under underground bunkers because everything on top of the top of the ground was blowing up and um, this corpsman come into a day and he's listening on the wall and they found out they were digging underneath the base so it, it's just one of those things I remember February 23rd 1968 we had been put on red alert for several nights already a ground long uh, 
found the tech eminent and I don't know how they keep track of this, but they figured that day our base took, and I told you before, the base wasn't very big, over 1,300 rounds of rocket artillery and mortar fire. And so it was just, um, I remember Major Havlick came in and there was a guy, Dan Decato, he was a Italian guy, and him and I both flew um, gunner and helicopter for a while, and so I don't know what he thought, being a gunner and helicopter, he gave us a law, LAW, uh, right any tank weapons, and if they basically hit the base with tanks, we were supposed to go out and hit the tank with that thing, but um, lucky enough they never come, because uh, I don't think that would have worked out too well for anybody. How long did the siege actually last before you were, you were relieved? Uh, it was 77 days total. It started in January 30th, went into April. So I got up there in um, about the uh, first 10 days of February, I think. And, um, you know, it was a tight group of guys, you know. It's, I, mean, I had one partner, and you never left the bunker, you never went by yourself. You always had somebody with you with 20 feet apart in case something happened. But, um, that name was Greg Zemanek from Fox Lake, Illinois, and my biggest regret was I should have taken, you know, home addresses and stuff from people so you could keep in contact with them after. Um, didn't think of that, but, um, I mean, it was what it was, you know, I mean, you just went from day to, you didn't make long-term um, long plans, you just went from day to day. Did you have mail coming in from stateside? No, okay. there, was, there was no mail coming uh, in. Now, that's a long time. Did you just have sea rations out of cans, or were there actual mess cooks there no, with hot that, meals? All that was blown up. There was not a building above ground that was standing. Um, it was sea rations all the time, but you know what? Even sea rations, when it comes right down to them, if you had peaches and pound cake, <laughs> hey, man, you had a meal. <laughs> if you had ham and lima beans, you smoked your cigarettes that came with the sea rations. <laughs> what? Did you have facilities for bathing, showers, and shaving? And, no, uh, um, we had, um, you had like this little powder, dusting powders, and you'd uh, shoot it down the back of your jacket or something. I mean, no, there was no facilities like that. Uh, we were lucky enough we had water to drink because even that had to be gotten in from outside the baseline. So um, there wasn't water to, water to waste. When you'd be being shelled around the clock, how did you sleep? I mean, that's... This happened most of the time during the days. Um, our best um, defense there was fog. As long as there was fog over the base, there was fog every morning. Um, if they couldn't see when they were shelling us where it was landing, we didn't get shelled. But as soon as the fog lifted, then, yeah, they started coming in. So, it was, I said, it was, every day was, you know, what, we knew we were going to get hit. It's just a matter of what time is it going to start, but... It wasn't too much at night because they couldn't see the landing either, so. Okay. Give the microphone to Alan. Uh, Ralph mentioned that he really wished he'd have kept in touch with his friends. Now, you were wounded. You came back here. Uh, you've been going to reunion since then. Do you, how many in your circle of people have served with you? Do you, you have reunions? Tell us a little bit about that. Anybody else close by in the tri-state area? Uh, or? There, there were only two other guys from the Wisconsin area, and I have not been successful in reaching them. You kind of knew where they were from. Uh, There's probably about uh, 60 of us that uh, still get together, and when I say that number, some of them are family members uh, that the, uh, the, the guy is passed uh, since then uh, for one reason or another, but the families will still uh, come to the reunions and stuff. Uh, we were supposed to have one about a year ago out in Las Vegas, but uh, with the COVID, uh, everything kind of got shot down a little bit. Uh, you, you have been state commander of the American Legion and many other uh, offices and posts at the VA. It would seem that you'd be able to find abilities to find these people now in the information age uh, with all of your connections. Well, because I came home via the hospital route uh, a little bit before I was, I was there a little over 10 months uh, before I, I got wounded the second time. And uh, in between being in the hospital for 
a good six months after that. Uh, it was hard to uh, keep in contact with people. And a couple of my uh, real good friends who were from California, uh, I actually did know where had their address and stuff. But you try to contact them a couple of times, and if they don't respond, uh, you get a little leery about, well, maybe he didn't make it back and you don't want to bug the family about it anymore or anything like that. More questions, more hands up here. Can, Anybody, can, can I just, can, can yeah, I just finish the young man who asked about the M16s, about what you carried? Uh, after I, I was thinking about that, and the, the first time we went out, you had these little uh, uh, packet uh, pouches uh, that you would carry like two clips in each, you know, and uh, the first firefight we got into, uh, those went real quick. <laughs> and then you're sitting there without any ammunition. So after that, uh, I used to actually wear a bandolier filled full of clips all around me and uh, all the grenades and everything I could carry <laughs> after that. <laughs> Um, I'm asking this to my grandpa. Um, so I know you flew in a helicopter, so what kind of helicopter did you fly in and what kind of machine gun did you shoot out the window? I flew in what's called a UA-34D. It's like a small, um, looks like a grasshopper. It's got one main rotor and then a pylon rotor. And um, you, there was a pilot, a co-pilot, and there was a door gunner and I was a window gunner. And um, you could take about six American troops on there because they were heavier. Uh, you could do uh, about eight or nine Arvin troops because of, they were smaller people, so you could get more of those on. Anything else? <laughs> okay. I wanted to ask a question. Did anybody know the last pro athlete that died in combat before Pat Tillman in the Middle East? And I knew nothing about this. In July of 2001, I was at the Milwaukee airport to pick up somebody for work. And that's when you could go down and wait for the sound about 20 minutes early. Oh, there's a bookstore up there. I went out to the bookstore, and I find this a guy in a military uniform, the 101st Airborne patch, Sports Illustrated? He was the only pro athlete, Bob Kelsu. All-American offensive tackle at Oklahoma State for two years, went on to be the Buffalo Bills Rookie of the Year, and got drafted. I open it up to the article, and I'm reading a little bit, and I just freeze. He was filled, killed on Firebase Ripcord on July 18th. I realized by reading the article, I was about eight or nine kilometers from Ripcord the day he was killed. And the terrible tragedy on top of that, his wife was notified in the hospital. Their son was born the day or two days before he was killed. And four or five days later, she got his last letter that they figured he mailed two days before he was killed. And he had a cute name that they quoted in here, Dear Honey something, whatever. I'm sure by now you're holding our darling little son. Please give him an extra special squeeze while you read this until I can give home and give him one myself. So that was kind of nice. Um, I want to ask a couple of questions. What was the origin of the swastika? In India. India. Yes, it was from somewhere, somewhere down in that area, yes. And uh, 58,000 soldiers died during the Vietnam War, 48 or 49,000 due to combat. And that's terrible. And when we got home, there was a lot of us were harassed by people that we were killing people and so on. What uh, could be considered a tragedy? Jane Fonda. Okay. <laughs> Would a homicide be considered a tragedy? Yeah. How many homicides were there in the United States during the Vietnam War? No, he's way over. 210,380. Would a traffic death be considered a tragedy? 470,000 traffic deaths during the Vietnam War. 
Now the next number that I got, I didn't believe it, but Jim Johnson, who happens to be the Ozaki County Sheriff, we were at a, at a Legion function, he said, Dick, that number's correct. 70% of the traffic deaths in the 70s were DUI, driving under the influence. Yeah, that was it. Okay, those were a couple of comments I wanted to make in addition. And by the way, I don't know if any saw, I have a pair of jungle boots. I wore these in Vietnam. And I have a knife here. When I got out in the boondocks, I sent home to my parents, send me a nice knife. They sent me this knife. I carried that with me in Vietnam. And I have a cap here that I wore in Vietnam. And a Petri 7S camera that I bought down in Fort Polk, Louisiana. And I carried this with me in Vietnam. And one thing I never took a picture of was war dead, enemy soldiers, anything like that. That was a very bad offense, and you could get in big trouble doing that. I never took any pictures of that. What, what do you have back there on your chair? Oh, well, i got to show you this. This is a jungle jacket. I wore this in Vietnam at the end, and when we came back to the States, we had on our jungle uh, fatigues that we wore over there, and I kept these, and I kept this one on the side, and pretty nice. We have a Civil War expert here, and uh, on, this <laughs> on, this on this patch, uh, Peter Jacobson is going to tell us what this is. What's that uh, bird there? Tell us some stories on that. Somebody said honest Abe. <clears throat> no, that's old Abe. Yeah. The uh, eagle mascot. The eagle mascot of the <clears throat> 8th Wisconsin Infantry during the Civil War. Well, how about and that? Yeah, you knew that? Was, no, I did not know that. Yes. Uh, he was stuffed into the uh, uh, house chambers in the, with Madison, I think. Yeah. yeah. If you go in there now, yeah. it got burned down in two, it's a replica. 1912, the Capitol was on fire and they got burned up. Yeah, it burned, it burned up. Roast chicken. Yeah, it burned up in the fire, but there's a replica there. Yeah. Now. You go in the house chamber above <laughs> the podium where the governor speaks, you'll see, you'll see it up there. Interesting story about that, <clears throat> if you could take a minute. Sure, go ahead. Uh, one of my cars has license plate on it says Old 8th 8th, 8th Wisconsin. <clears throat> Civil War Roundtable meets uh, once a month at the Wisconsin Club. And the valets pick up your car. So uh, on the way out, the meeting's over, I'm getting my car, and the young man, the valet, he says, oh, I like your license plate. I said, well, uh, do you know what that means, what the old Abe's all about? He said, yeah, absolutely I do. I have a big uh, picture of him in my dorm room. And so I, I went over the story with him a little bit, and I said, well, there's a replica of him in the uh, uh, state house. And the next time, well, he was a, a, a student at the University of Wisconsin, and the next time you go in, when you're there, when you have some time, go in and take a look, and you'll see him up there. And he says, well, geez, I wonder if my father knows about that. I said, well, who's your father? He says, Governor Walker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jacobson. One comment on this. That eagle was given to a Civil War unit from Eau Claire by an American Indian. And they would carry that eagle into battle and they would have a wooden uh, perch for the thing. And when the Confederates came and advanced the fighting, that bird would fly up above the battlefield and flap its wings and, and scream at the, at the enemy. And so he was the mascot, old Abe. Screaming Eagles. Screaming, Screaming Eagles is what they call 101st Airborne Division. And they're still active today in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, like the 82nd Airborne and some of the Marines, they're always on ready. There's a trouble somewhere in the world. Those men will be loaded in their airplanes, and they'll be some of the first to be dropped in. And heaven help us, they don't have to go over in anything in Ukraine. But a little trivia. Tell your neighbors there's a connection, 101st Airborne, to the uh, state of Wisconsin in the Civil War time. Peter, we'll get to you in just a second. So old Abe was transferred here uh, before World War II to the 101st. So now you have this local trivia. I'm just going to make Wait. They won't hear you. 
I was just going to make a comment. It's also the symbol for case tracks it down in there, you see? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. What else do you have there? Oh, I wanted to show. Here's a Timex watch that I bought down in Fort Polk, Louisiana. I think I paid 12 or $13 for it at a pawn shop. And I wore that watch in Vietnam. Not with that, uh, it had a, a, a leather strap on it at the time. But I wore that there. And before I went out to the boondocks, a chaplain gave us a little Bible. I have that Bible to this day. And the rosary. And every night when I was on guard, I prayed the rosary with this rosary. And thank you, God, for letting me get out of there alive. Anybody else? Otherwise, I've got to go. Okay, here we go. We're running out of time, so if you have questions, you put your hand up and get to it. Otherwise, I have a few as we close up. Could somebody hand this over? This is probably directed at Al or anybody that went on patrol and run into the enemy. You said you were carrying the radio and you might call it all in. What types of resources did you have when you had ran into the enemy and you got in a firefight? What resources were you calling in? Or were they readily available or you just sort of hoped? Um, well, a lot of times when we would uh, go out on a mission, uh, search and destroy or whatever, uh, we'd go out as a company, uh, and the mortar platoon, which I, I was with, uh, would go out as a rifle company during the day. And once we got to where they were setting up for the night, uh, they would uh, sometimes fly in the mortars, uh, the 81 mortars, and there would always be one platoon that would go out from there to set up an ambush or to try to find a supply line or something. And uh, I went with the, I always went with the third platoon because their lieutenant was uh, West Point Ranger, airborne, the, you know. So I figured if I'm gonna go out, I'm not gonna go out with a 90 day wonder, I'm gonna go out with somebody who really knows what they're doing. And uh, there were occasions where uh, people did come through at night, Viet Cong, and uh, we usually set out Claymore mines or whatever. Uh, but if that wasn't enough, then I would start to call in uh, the mortars to start out with, and uh, everything there was, I, I told Dick one time that he was talking about being out in the mountains, I said the only thing above sea level uh, where I was, was something man-made. Uh, so everything was just flat, and you know, where are you at? Well, we're by the stream, you know. Would, <laughs> You know, so what we would do, what I would do, is uh, before we went out, uh, we were giving uh, a, a code that I would call in and ask for an aerial burst, uh, white phosphorus aerial burst uh, would go off, and I know where the coordinate is, so then I could look at that and then judge from that where we were, and then I'd be able to call in the artillery. Uh, sometimes if we were close enough to the ocean, we could actually call in the naval uh, uh, bombardment. But uh, a lot of times when we were in bigger uh, uh, battles, uh, the helicopters would come in. And they were readily, they were usually pretty readily available. A question for all three of you or any of you. Um, Alan, you were there a little earlier in 67, but Ralph, 68, Dick, 70 and 71. Back home, the so-called hippie movement started. And there's a lot of war protesters. Were you aware of any of that when you were over there? And what did you think of it? Uh, when I was there, I remember uh, getting a letter from my older sister uh, who uh, said don't listen, because that was about the time Father Grappi was doing his, his deal down in Milwaukee. And uh, she just kept sending, you know, uh, encouraging things. And uh, she was very religious, you know, so God was looking over you and don't pay attention to any of that other stuff. And 
uh, again, when I came home, and I came home uh, via the hospital route, I was down at the Great Lakes Naval Hospital for about three months. Uh, but this area was very welcoming. I ran into very little uh, stuff. But like you said, when we had reunions, and I'd run into some of my buddies, again, from California, and that, uh, yeah, they were spit on. They were actually spit on and harassed when they when they came home, and fortunately, I didn't run into that. But when you were over in Nam, were you men reading the newspapers and magazines yeah, and like, hey, what's going on in San Francisco with end the war and all that stuff? Were you aware of any, any of that at that time? I used to Google that. And, <laughs> no, uh, that's, no, we, we didn't. Uh, <laughs> we, we didn't get a lot of news, okay. let's put it that way. Ralph, and then... Uh, no, it's... Uh, Good. <laughs> That's a good one. Now, um, I was the oldest in my family, so everybody was younger, and no, I really didn't know anything. I was no, nobody ever, you know, I was a farm boy from Adel. I was standing in my field, you know, up at Adel. We didn't have any hippies. You know, they probably still don't have any hippies. Um, but um, I wasn't aware of it, and not really, when I came home on leave, you go back to Random Lake to the Globe Lanes. You know, those are just regular working people. I mean, they weren't even associated with the hippie movement. So, no, I had really no knowledge of that. Yeah, how about you? Were you aware of that? Were yeah, we were a little bit aware of it over there. It didn't bother us a whole lot because there was nothing we could do about it. And we were sent here, so we're doing our job. And uh, I remember when I got home, I lived just, did anybody know where Weiler's was? Oh, Don't yeah. mind. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I lived a, born and raised on a farm a mile and a half north of Weiler's. And I was home, I don't know, maybe a week and a half or so, and I stopped at Weiler's one night, and a couple of guys across the bar, but they were guys I went to high school with. Hey, Dick, when did you get home? A week ago Sunday, whatever. A guy come up to me, and he says, so, you were a baby killer, huh? I didn't know what happened, but the guy fell down in the corner. <laughs> I told him, I said, Hey, you SOB, the last guy I hated, I killed. You don't want me to hate you. <laughs> he came over about 10 or 15 minutes later and apologized. He said that he was out of line and he shouldn't have done that. That was kind of nice. But other than that, when I came home, minimal harassment, really. From... Okay, we're going to ask for closing comments a little while. You keep your microphone. Uh, from military to civilian life, no matter what you're doing, doing is not easy. Coming back from a war zone, having seen combat, what kind of adjustment and readjustment did each one of you had? Did you have flashbacks, nightmares? Did you get right back into going to school or working again? So give a quick snapshot, each of you, for your readjustment when you got back. Dick, you go first. Uh, I went back to my old job at Milwaukee Gear, and I was treated very good down there by the people there. There was a couple people that harassed me, and there was more people that went after that person than I needed to go. And uh, I was, like I said, born and raised out in Belgium, for Washington area, and the people there were very good to me when I got home. Uh, I was treated extremely well by them. When I got home, um, I was staying at Camp Pendleton, and um, I was in Oceanside one day because I worked every other day at the airfield, and a highway patrol car drove in. I thought that wouldn't be a bad job. So basically, I went from four years of military, um, rules and regulations, into the California Highway Patrol. And um, I spent 28 and four years out there, moved back here with my wife and one daughter. And uh, spent 28 and a half years in, um, with Fox Point Police Department and 10 years with the Sheriff's Department here. So. I just kind of transitioned from one uniform to another. <laughs> That's good. Uh, well, I was a little bit different because uh, I did come home uh, via, yeah, I'm different, believe me. Uh, uh, they tried to get you as close to home as possible. Uh, at that time, it was called Woods, now it was a blocky. Uh, it was all filled up. So the closest place I could get to home was down at Great Lakes uh, Naval Hospital. And uh, because I was down there, uh, 
for months, uh, you got time to acclimate back in, into uh, civilian life. And I actually really believe that a lot of the problems now with the, the suicide rate among uh, veterans, or young veterans, is because of uh, the way the military is today. It's it, most, there's hardly any standing army. Everything is Army Reserve or, or uh, National Guard, and these uh, men and women get activated uh, to go over and combat, if you really, yeah, it's like nothing else you'll ever experience in your life. It's a whole, uh, a whole different thing. And uh, you, sometimes you get hardened. I think you asked something about uh, how you felt over there about some of this stuff that uh, the first time you have ca casualties within your group, uh, it's very sad, it's very, you know, the, it's terrible. Uh, by the end, you go, oh yeah, he died. You know, you, you just, you get so hard, you get hardened to it, you can't let your emotions uh, take over. A lot of that is, you know, the group of guys I was with was with humor. You know, like you see a mash. You know that that was a way to deal with it. But these men and women today, they go, they get sent home. You know, and then the next day is, hey, grab your lunchbox. You need to go back to work. They don't have time to acclimate back in. Uh, like Ralph said, go to a, a military base and uh, spend time getting back in what we refer to as the real world. And I think that's what a lot of the problems are, are now. These men and women are expected to come home and boom, go back to work the next day. I'm gonna ask you gentlemen each for closing comments, uh, but first a few announcements. So get your thoughts together, the final things you wanna address. We've got 120 people here. Eric. Uh, Let's get started. You know, things uh, such as could the war have been won, uh, attitudes back then or now. This is already 50, 55 years ago. So get your thoughts together. Each one of you will have a closing comment. But uh, once again, everybody, May 16th. It's kind of crowded here. We got 120 people, but we've had as many as 200. Uh, one time we had more than 200. We had the man who dropped the atomic bomb on Nagasaki. He was the third pilot. He was from Chicago. I drove down there and had breakfast with him and told him about our group. This is uh, 20 years ago, matter of fact. And uh, Fred O'Levy was his name. I'm having breakfast. I told him about our group. And I said, would you care to drive up a couple hours and just tell our group about this? I will put you up at the Baymont and uh, pay for your gasoline. And he said, yeah, I'll be glad to. And he signed the autograph that's on the wall over here. His name was Fred O'Levy. But we had so many people to come hear him. We had people eat downstairs, and they took their chairs up here to hear it. So don't be daunted by a crowded place here. Uh, we can get more than this in here. And if you have friends, family, neighbors, and so on, tell them about our group. We're, we are quite unique. And if you know people that like, hey, you know, my uncle Wally, he, he was here or there. He'd be a good guy to uh, talk to your group. Bring him here. Introduce him to us. And uh, we're, we're very user friendly to everybody. Ladies, you know you're welcome here, young people. So in closing here, come back May 16th. We take our summer break and in September and October, I'm working on some pretty good things because after the two year COVID break, uh, people want to get out and I have some things in the pipeline again. So anyway, gentlemen, closing comments here on any thoughts you'd like to share with us as we wrap up the evening. I don't know and it's hard to say. Um, one thing I will say about I, my late wife and I bought the house out north of Grafton here in 1974. And all the while I've been around Grafton, I've never really been harassed or anything about being a veteran or that I was in Vietnam or anything like that. So I've basically been treated very good by the people around here. And if I go up to Belgium where I was there, it's pretty much the same thing there. The good old Luxembourgers, 
They treated me good. I, <laughs> lots of burgers. I shouldn't laugh. I'm part lots of burger. <laughs> and uh, they treated us all pretty good. And I'm glad I wasn't in the part of the country where a lot of that crap was going on. That was a bummer. Uh, any questions that anybody would have for me? You know, later, you know, when we're done, we're going to close up, but they'll still be here. You can ask them more questions, and they are regulars here. Al is the, the manager of the hall. He's here every time, back in the bar. You can talk to him. Uh, so, closing comments from you, Ralph. All I'm going to say is, you know, I never regretted um, enlisting in the Marine Corps. I'm glad I could serve my country, and um, I'm proud of the job I did. That's all I want to say. That's good. We're proud of you too, Ralph. Thank you, Al. We're proud, Ralph. Good job. Um, I remember uh, being drafted and going down to Fort Leonard Wood, and the first night down there having to walk uh, the fire guard because those buildings down there supposedly would burn down in six minutes or something. And, uh, you know, thinking, how am I going to get out of this? You know, and, uh, and then I just remembered something that uh, one of my, I come from a, military family there were three marines and three of us in the army and uh, my older brother had had uh, given me a quote about uh, life is 10 uh, percent of uh, what happens to you and 90 percent of how you react to it basic uh, what I, the quote was uh, basically you know it, how do you react to it you know so i did but, well, I'm here, I might as well make the best out of it, you know, do my best that I can. Uh, when I came back and started uh, having reunions with, with uh, the guys that uh, were able to contact and get together with, and some of them have gone back to Vietnam, and I, I go, why? <laughs> I don't understand that. But, um, the lieutenant uh, that I was with uh, was kind of like uh, Lieutenant Dan, uh, Forrest Gump. Matter of fact, if you watch Forrest Gump when he's talking to his girlfriend in Washington, D.C. on the plaza, the uniform he's wearing is exactly the same uniform that I wore. The, the patches, the unit patches on them and everything are exactly the same. Uh, but anyways, we had uh, one of our lieutenants, uh, ben Benedict, uh, lost both of his, his legs. And he became an uh, Olympic uh, champion skier. And uh, we kind of all looked up to uh, him. And one of his thoughts to us was uh, the best that we can do is uh, to go home and live our lives the best we can we could and to make sure that no other veteran would be treated like we were treated when we came home. So that's kind of uh, how I got active in the American Legion and uh, doing the things that I did through the American Legion was because of that. I wanted to make sure that no other veteran would ever get treated like the Vietnam veterans did. I just, I gotta make one comment here. The story is here at the post. One of our post members approached Al one time about joining the American Legion. He said, yeah, I'll, I'll join, but I don't really want to get too involved. He ended up with his state commander. <laughs> <laughs> Plus a lot of other things. So, yeah, so much for involvement. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, thanks for sharing with us. We really appreciate you doing this. If you want to say anything, we honor you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.